Look at Judges chapter 13. We're going to look at the story of Samson today, one of the judges, and obviously the strongest <clears throat> man physically, I believe, to ever live. Um, do you think that this was uh, natural physical strength, that uh, he was just a very big, strong-looking man? Uh, or was it uh, only the uh, Spirit of the Lord coming upon him? And he just looked like an average person, you know. <clears throat> and then he became really strong when he needed it. Or do you think it's a combination of both? Trevor? Um, maybe a little bit of a combination of both, but at the very end of the story, um, it says that he became as weak as any other man, so he probably wasn't abnormal physically. Mm -hmm. Because that weakness came upon him, so he obviously didn't have more muscles than the average person. <clears throat> sure. At the end. Anybody else? Anybody? Like average size. Sure. Probably what strong looking. But. <laughs> all, all the women wanted, <laughs> all the women were willing to put up with the guy. <laughs> so, especially the Philistine women. <clears throat> Sorry? Hair. His, his hair. <laughs> sure, I understand that. So, all right, so uh, we're going to be seeing here the uh, Philistine oppression and the coming of Samson. And so let's uh, open a word of prayer and get started today. I'm going to ask Rick if you'd open us, please. Amen. All right, look at Judges chapter 13. <clears throat> Children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. All right, so let's talk about the Philistine oppression before we talk about Samson himself, the deliverer. Uh, this is the longest oppression of any of the oppressors, and uh, this is later on in the time of the Judges. <clears throat> Anybody want to tell us why we can assume that? Why we believe that this is later on in the time of the judges? It's the Philistines. What do we know about 1 Samuel? <laughs> right? Samuel. Um, remember that big battle in 1 Samuel chapter 7, chapter 8 against the Philistines? <clears throat> Saul becomes the king. Who are some of his main enemies? The Philistines. David, right? Uh, even early in Saul's reign, David is a young man, and he fights one of their, uh, well, well, their main champion, uh, Goliath. So, but, uh, so this is definitely towards the end of the time of the judges, leading into the time of the kings. So for 40 years. What about their history? Um, the Bible doesn't tell us much of their history, but we do see some of their other history in, uh, in other sources. Most people believe that they were a sea people, for example, from some island in the Mediterranean, the, the Cretans from Crete or something like that, that they came over from some islands out in the Mediterranean and uh, they wanted to be on a mainland where they could expand more. They were a large group of people, or became a large group of people. They had attacked Egypt and been turned away from there in somewhere around 1200 BC. And so they just moved up the coast of the Mediterranean and came into the, what would be the land of Canaan and settled there. <clears throat> Seems pretty natural in the southwest part of Palestine, and we know that they're pretty powerful at different times. In Judges chapter 3, even verse 31, Shamgar slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad. Now, that's just a little thing on him. Um, we also see in chapter 10 of Judges, chapter 10, verses 7 through 11. Anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He sold them in the hands of the Philistines, in the hands of the Ammonites. So there again mentions the Philistines. So there's different times where they were somewhat powerful. And then during this time, towards the end of the, of the time of the judges, definitely were very powerful. 
Um, this is the most serious of all the oppressions as well. What I mean by that, uh, it was the most dangerous. It was the most threatening to the land of Canaan, I think, uh, of any of them. Um, there were lots of Midianites, but the Midianites didn't live there. They were just raiding through the land and stealing all the food, which is definitely a threat. But I'm saying the Midianites didn't have cities and they didn't have walled cities. The Philistines, on the other hand, had uh, a whole set of cities that were walled and so on. At least five major cities, uh, part of that pentapolis of Philistine cities down in that southwest corner. Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, Gaza, and... I'm missing one. Anyway, there's one more. Oh, well. Um, Ekron. There we go. Ekron. So there's five major cities. So they were a real threat. They lived right there next to the children of Israel, as we'll see with Samson here. I mean, he lived a few miles from the closest Philistine city. A few miles. Uh, it'd be literally like going for less than from here to Portage. Okay, that's how close they were in proximity. So they're a very serious threat. Um when they raided directly into the land from their cities, into the area around Judah and so on, uh, that was the closest that uh, the people lived to them. But uh, there were also different times where the Philistines raided all the way up to the north, down through the valley of Jezreel. And that's where we see uh, Saul being killed, is all the way up there to the north, about 60 to 70 miles away that the Philistines were expanding and trying to take over the entire land. <coughs> so it's a very serious threat is the point uh, coming from the Philistines. Well, that brings us then to Samson, uh, the, the judge. So let's talk about several things about Samson. First of all, I want you to see his parents, his parents, and some, let's make some points here about them. Verse number two, there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites. Now, that Zorah, that's a valley, that's an area that uh, they lived in. There are lots of valleys in this area. I have a map here of uh, some of Samson's forays down into the land of the Philistines and carrying the gates uh, from Gaza all the way over to Hebron and so on. So that's kind of neat. But what it doesn't really show you is the, the valleys. And this whole area through here, well, it's named here, actually, the Shephelah. That is a series of valleys that lead from the mountain range right here out into the plains. And so these valleys, are there, most of them are named, and, and we know a lot of them. Um, Beth Shemesh, we'll talk about that later when, when the Ark of God was brought back from the Philistines. Uh, they came up through the valley to Beshemesh. Uh, Zora is mentioned as a valley. Anybody remember some other valleys that are mentioned kind of related to this? Where was Delilah from? Sorek. Um, Beth Horon is another place uh, earlier in Joshua that's mentioned. That's not far from here, another valley. Uh, what about uh, where David killed Goliath? Elah. E-L-A-H. So these are several valleys of the Shephelah, these series of, of basically their pathways leading out from the mountain. You know, millions of years ago, there was a heat. No, I'm kidding. But uh, typically they would say that uh, these mountains exploded and it just washed away certain huge sections of it and left these massive valleys. And that's probably the case, except that it wasn't millions of years ago. Uh, it was about 5,000 years ago or less. So let's talk about his parents. Uh, the Bible says here they were the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah and his wife was barren and bare not. Now, hang on here. Manoah from the tribe of Dan. When did the Danites head north? Okay, let me pull up our map here. So that presents a little bit of a problem. <clears throat> The Danites were down here. They moved way up north to the city of Dan. But uh, so where does this fit into the story? If we're saying that this story of Samson takes place because of the Philistines, later on, it's normally assumed that the 
tribe of Dan didn't move, and, or that they moved about halfway through or so the period of the judges. So we got a little problem here. Anybody have a comment on that, or I thought you were going to say something? The Danites that moved from Micah? Yes. Okay. Right. That's, you're, yeah, that's the story I'm referring to in chapter 17 and chapter 18. Verse 18, chapter 18, verse 1. In those days, the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. Any comments on that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good point. There's probably a number of the tribe of Dan that didn't leave. Now, uh, we'll talk about this, uh, well, we'll see it here real soon, where they lived at. And those vineyards of, uh, where does it say, it names them off, Who uh, or where was it? Timnath, there we go. No, no, sorry, that's the, where the woman was from. Um... Where is it, Timnath? I'm thinking of. He was on his way. No, it says verse five. He was at the vineyards of Timnath. Okay, well, but anyway, where where uh, Samson lived was in the mountains, and those vineyards were on the mountains, and we know that from a uh, well at Beth Shemesh when we were there, we were it was pointed out to us that right across the valley. Up on those hills are what were known as the vineyards of Timnath. And so anyway, that reminds me of the place in Judges, chapter 1 and chapter 2, I believe it was, where the uh, tribe of Dan said, we cannot cast out the people here. We have to stay in the mountains and they stay at the Philistines, not Philistines, but the Canaanites and others live in the, in the valleys and we can't kick them out. So... It fits with that, that they were kind of suppressed. They had to stay in their own area, mountaintop, away from the Philistines, away from the Canaanites. So it's very likely that, these, that the, the main part of the tribe of Dan had moved, but not everybody had moved. And there's, there's nothing wrong, I don't think, with, with assuming that <clears throat> to be the case. Okay, so let's mention a couple other things uh, about his parents. We see that uh, an angel of God came to them and announced his birth. So his birth, his birth was announced by Jesus Christ. His birth was announced. This is, uh, of course, a, uh, not the only time that this kind of thing takes place. Can you think of some others where an angel or the angel of God, Jesus himself, Announced the birth of a son, John the Baptist, Isaac, very good, you got that one, and then there's the third one, no, not an angel, just give me the uh, good simple Sunday school answer, Jesus, very good, uh, Mary, it was announced to her that she would also have a son. So there's three of these announcings by the angel of God about the birth of a son. The angel came to Manoah's wife first. In Abraham's case, the angel came to Abraham. But, and, and the same with Zechariah and, and John the Baptist. But in this case, they came to the wife first. I mean, I don't really have a reason for that. Uh, maybe she had more faith to believe. I don't know. But she told her husband, and so he asked for another uh, appearance, and the angel of God came again to him. In verse 9, Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman made haste. She did whatever. Verse 11. Um, oh, sorry. Anyway, verse 8. Uh, they let the man of God which thou didst send come again. There it is, verse 8. Manoah asked two questions. Of the angel of God, <clears throat> two questions about the son. The two questions are, what is the ordering of the child? Let me see here. Verse number 12. Manoah said, now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child and how shall we do unto him? So he asked, what's the order? How do we, what are we supposed to do with him? What are we supposed to do with him? 
Uh, I think that's a pretty good question. Now, they didn't, obviously didn't do uh, <laughs> a very good job in some areas, um, especially in the area of self-control and uh, morality and so on. But he asked at this point, what is the ordering of the child? Then another question then was, what's he going to do? In other words, what's his vocation? What's he going to do? What's, uh, uh, how shall we do unto him? I believe that's the question that he's asking. Good questions to ask of the Lord when you have children. <clears throat> not only, um, they're not the only ones, of course. Uh, I just want to point this out here. I think it's a good time to do this. They're not the only ones that couldn't have children, that God gave to them children. Um, there's Sarah, of course, Rebecca entreated uh, of the Lord for a child. Of course, you have Hannah, um, Elizabeth, all of the people we mentioned, and a couple others. So uh, God gave them children directly because of prayer and uh, seeking the Lord. All right, we also see one last thing about his parents, and that is that they allowed him to be influenced too much by the people around them. <clears throat> they allowed him to be influenced too much, I believe. It, it wasn't God's way. Well, let me just read the verse to you. When uh, Samson is growing up, chapter 14, verse 1, Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines, and he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. It wasn't God's way for the children of Israel, God's people, to go out and find a wife like that in, in this method. It was God's way for the parents to choose a wife for their son, and it, that's, that wife would come from their tribe. Right? To keep the inheritance within the family, within the tribe. And so they let Samson go out by himself down to Timnath with the Philistines. Bad move. Uh, this, is, this is a real lack of uh, discernment, I believe, on the part of his parents. So that they allowed him to be influenced too much by the Philistines. And so then he wants a wife the same way they would marry. Hey, I, I saw this pretty woman. I want her. Get her for me. So he's influenced way too much by the, uh, by the crowd and by the people around them. By the way, don't knock Samson too much for having some interaction with the Philistines. Uh, that was the way, it, the, it, that was life. Just like we have interaction with the world. Um, we, we have to. We live amongst the world. It's a picture of that. But uh, what we can't do is let our children or ourselves start to think that that's the way it should be done. Let the world think we're weird. And I don't believe in betrothal but in our day. But let the world think we're weird because we're not like them. That's okay. Uh, if they think we're weird, that's a good thing. They're not the ones that uh, should be our standard anyway. So we see some things there about his parents. Now, let me mention some general facts about Samson next. Some general facts about Samson. You know some of these. You might know all of them. He was uh, a Nazarite. He was under the Nazarite vow from his birth. Chapter 13, verse 5. It was announced at his conception that he, actually before his conception, for lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son and no razor, shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. So, from the womb, he was a Nazarite. Never was supposed to have a haircut um, and some other things. The book of Numbers chapter 6 gives the outline of what a Nazarite vow entailed. And so you know these three things. No haircut. Uh, that meant that he wasn't even supposed to have a razor come upon his head. And I believe that to include a beard. See? So don't even pull out that argument. You're not Nazarites. 
I want a beard. See, Sam yeah, Samson also had long hair, and he was a few other things. Um, so don't pull that argument up, Bob. Uh, no razor on his head, no wine or any kind of grape product. Okay, so why not? What's grape? What's so special about grapes? I think in our day, if we are in a kind of a, com a comparison to that, I think it would be sugar that we were, he wasn't allowed to enjoy anything that was for mirth, that was for fun. He wasn't allowed to, you know, when you had a party, you always had grape juice. When you had a bad party, you always had fermented grape juice, wine. So he wasn't allowed to have any of these indulgences, if you will, something to enjoy, to indulge himself with, such as, uh, and again, I think you compare that to sugar, no pop, um, no sweets, no, no, nothing to enjoy. Everything was just normal food. And of course, that was uh, their, kind of their version of, of uh, drink to enjoy to, for the you know, for the mirth of the soul. All right, so that one would be very difficult. By the way, that no grape product, that included any kind of grape. Grape jelly, uh, or, uh, not oranges, wow. Raisins, dried grapes, um, obviously wine, fresh wine. Um, is there something else I'm missing there? Anyway, so no grapes at all. And then the third thing was, not to have contact with anything unclean. Anything unclean. And that, of course, primarily included a dead body of any kind. Funerals. Um, I, as I understand it, they were allowed to go to a funeral. Their funerals are different than ours. But they weren't allowed to... Uh, be involved in the funeral process at all of, uh, you know, of burying the body. In, in our day, we have these elaborate coffins and all these things. In those days, it, it involved touching the body. Uh, they didn't have a funeral home to do the work. And so they would do the work themselves or have a doctor that they knew do the work. But then it was the family very much hands-on involved in the preparation of the body. Yes. Does uh, like taking a Nazarite vow? Do you think that's something that someone chose? Like they were, they chose to live that way? Or? Oh, okay. Good question. Um, absolutely, there were people who took upon themselves some you know many different vows, and their vows usually involve some fasting or definitely abstaining from th certain things, and and certainly people took on for a period of time a Nazarite vow. Um, there's records of uh, people taking a Nazarite vow for a month, for six months, for a year. And then there's a few in the Bible that are listed lifetime. Which would be, I, mean, I would really stink, you know. <clears throat> um, Joe Norman has a very close identity with that. You know, there's nothing he can eat. <laughs> um, I'm kidding. <clears throat> I always feel bad for him. Whew, chocolate, can't have it. You know, just about anything that we enjoy, he can't eat. Uh, is the way I see it. But. All right, so those three things, no unclean contact. Those are all found in Numbers chapter 6. Now, Samson violated, I believe, all three of these. Now, let's talk about these. We know when he violated some of them, for sure, and then the others are a little bit more, more iffy. Uh, he had his hair cut by Delilah and, and the barbers. He also, um, he was involved with an unclean animal, a dead animal, when he went back to the lion and he got uh, honey out of the lion. Is that found in chapter, no, that's not, let me check and make sure. 16, 19 is when he had his hair cut. 16, 19. In chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, he went back to the carcass of the lion. 
And then it, it's believed in verse 10 that uh, he broke the vow of uh, not having any wine. Verse 10, his father went down unto the woman and Samson made there a feast. For so used the young men to do this feast, it's believed, certainly would have included wine. Okay, so Samson violated, I believe, all three of these uh, parts of the Nazarite vow. All right, let me mention a couple other things about Samson. Uh, we also know, despite what he did wrong with that, we know that the Spirit of God enabled Samson. The Spirit of God enabled Samson at least four different occasions. So let's note these four occasions down. In chapter 13, verse 25, this is uh, Samson is a young man. The Spirit of, of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. Now, when you see the camp of Dan, that fits with our theory that the Danites were very, you know, very loosely established in their own territory. And that would include Samson and his family. So he, uh, the Spirit of God came upon him in chapter 13, verse 25. In chapter 14, then, verse 6, when the lion roared against him coming out of the vineyard of Timnath, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he, as he would have rent a kid. It's not a child, that's a goat, which even that is kind of odd to me. That the Bible come, I guess, you know, if you had a goat attacking you, you grab that, I mean, I don't know, I just have a hard time picturing this, you know, as if he would have, I mean, it was as easy as tearing a goat apart. I don't know. You know, they lived very different back then than we do today, and we understand that. We also see in chapter 14, verse 19 then, Chapter 14, verse 19. We'll get to these stories individually. Chapter 14, verse 19. Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he went down to Ashkelon. Now this is with his attempted marriage. He had put out a riddle and uh, his, his uh, opponents got his future wife to tell them the riddle. And she begged Samson until he told her the riddle. What, what a wuss. He is with women. Man, he just cannot tell them no. And uh, so anyway, he finally tells her the riddle. And so they come and they figure out the riddle. And now he has to provide each of them with a change of clothes. And so in order to do that, he doesn't go to J.C. Penney and buy him clothes. He goes down and kills 30 people in Ashkelon. But in order to do that, God put his spirit upon him. Even in this ridiculous situation, God put his spirit upon him. And Samson goes down there and kills 30 men of Ashkelon. Verse 19, he slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. I'll give you, think about that. And the Spirit of the Lord coming upon Samson, even for these foolish things. Let's, uh, I'll ask you about that in just a second after I give you the other ones here. Chapter 14, we mentioned verse 19. Chapter 15 now, verse 14. There's the jawbone of the ass that he uses to kill a thousand Philistines. When he came unto Lehi, the Philistine shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became his flax that was burnt with fire. They just fell apart. And his ba bands loosed from off his hands. He ripped them apart and just went on a killing spree. Okay, so those four times, it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Now, at the end of his life, it does not say that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He prayed and asked God for help. Verse 28, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines. So he grabs a hold of the pillars and he says, let me die with the Philistines. Now, I think that God came there to help him, but it doesn't say that at all. Because I don't think he could have done that, what he did, pushing those massive pillars out without the strength of the Lord being with him. I don't, I don't think so. But regardless, it doesn't say there that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Now, why 
does the Spirit of the Lord come upon Samson when he's getting ready to marry a uh, Philistine wife? Why does the Spirit of the Lord come upon him in some of these ridiculous situations when he's playing around with the Philistines? I mean, that's a pretty good indication to us, right? That we can kind of just do what we want. We can play games. And when we need the Spirit of God, just call out and get Him. I mean, it's that simple, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so even though he was doing his wicked things, God was work not necessarily well, he was working through him, basically, to deliver Israel. Okay. Anybody else? That's Wanna true. add to that? What I was gonna say is that each time that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him it was to accomplish his will, whether Samson was doing what he needed to do or not. Mm-hmm. So could you say that God used Samson because of his spiritual whatever, or in spite of him. <laughs> in spite. Um, I, I've heard a message preached by a very famous Baptist one at one time who said that God used Samson because of, and he used the idea of merits and demerits, and that Samson had built up enough merits that God used him in spite of the other things that he did. And so he used that to say that uh, if you build up enough, I mean, merits, what is that? Good works. Uh, he, was, uh, he wasn't preaching this for salvation, but he was preaching it, absolutely, that when you are going so hard for the Lord and you're winning souls, that was the main thing, you're winning as many people as you can, when you stumble and fall, God will pick you up and use you again. That was, the, that was the point of the message, and preachers were shouting amen. <laughs> All right, so obviously that's heresy. Okay? God doesn't use Samson because of him running so hard for the Lord and building up all these merits. Where were all the merits? I don't remember reading them. <laughs> I don't remember when he went winning souls and then stumbled a little bit, you know, with adultery and harlots, just a little fall, and then God continued to use him again. Meadow? Um, just first from the New Testament comes to mind, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. I mean, even the best things we can do, God still... <laughs> they don't so in other words, your merits aren't really that merit, meriting of favor. <laughs> yes? And even when he was empowered by the Spirit of God, everything he did was selfishly. Whenever he caught the foxes and tied their tails together, he it was it was because he wanted revenge. revenge. It was revenge. Partially motives. Okay, that's true, but it's also true that God used those selfish motives to accomplish the bigger picture, and that was to liberate Israel. It wasn't Samson. Think of it this way: What was always the reason that God sent a deliverer? The people repented. Remember the cycle? Uh, suffering, no, sin, suffering, supplication. After they prayed and asked God for help, God sent them a deliverer. It wasn't Samson being this great spirit. I don't believe now. There's a verse that kind of goes against that. But it wasn't Samson necessarily being this great spiritual re repenting leader, you know, like Josiah. He found the law and just wanted to worship God. No, it was the people repented. And so God used Samson in spite of him to deliver the people. Yes? But on the other hand, in Hebrews 11... Yes, there's the verse. Hebrews 11 says, and says his name. Time failed me to tell you of Barak and Samson, Gideon. <laughs> He's a man of faith. Okay, put it this, think of it this way with his faith. I think there it doesn't necessarily mean that he didn't do a lot of terrible things because he certainly did. So did Abraham, many wives. So did a lot of the Jephthah, and so did you know all these. You know Jephthah killed his own daughter. Ah, uh, had to stick that one in there. 
Um, so did a lot of these people. But did Samson have great faith? How would you like to be bound with ropes and your hands tied? And here come a thousand Philistines, more than a thousand. Here comes an army of Philistines. And you walk in there and you know. I mean, he gave himself up to them. And you know that God's going to deliver you. That's faith. It takes a lot of faith to do that. I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> uh, walk in there, and it's, when the time comes, you're weak, you're normal man, until all of a sudden, when the time comes, they're right there in front of you. They're surrounding you. I think that's the picture. They're completely surrounding him. He just rips them off and goes to work. So the things that he did definitely show faith, even though he himself had lots and lots of flaws. So but that, that is the passage that I was saying, you know, there's one passage that kind of seems to say he was spiritual. I, I think he was, he followed the spirit of God in some areas, but he obviously had many, many problems. All right, so the spirit of God came upon him in spite, not because of. Let me also mention a couple other things about Samson. So I'm still getting through this list of general facts about Samson. We also know that the book of Judges describes Samson more than any of the other judges. Except Gideon, sorry. The chapters on Gideon are longer. <laughs> Which is what, anyway, so judges describe Samson more than any judge except Gideon. A couple other thoughts concerning Samson. Twice... Samson asked for help, asked God for help, and God answered both times. We find one of those at the end of chapter 16. said, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray thee. And God helped him. The other time is in chapter 14. Um, verse 18. He was sore athirst. Sorry, 15 verse 18. He was sore athirst after he killed a thousand Philistines. That'll make you thirsty. And there, uh, he called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. But God clave a hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. He used that same jawbone he had just killed a thousand Philistines with, and God said, Hey, pop it open. And he Somehow he broke an end of it off or something, and it was filled with water, and he drank it. <laughs> That's pretty neat. So I want to see one of these you know, guys with their swords do that someday. They kill a whole bunch of people at night, and then they break their sword open and drink water out of it. You know. All right, one more, well, a couple more thoughts concerning Samson. He's also in the honor roll of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. He's listed as a man of great faith. And then the last general thing about him, he had a lust for ungodly women. He lusted after ungodly women. There are several occasions listed. Uh, two of them include his bride from Timnath, who begged for the answer to his riddle, and then Delilah. So those two we can pretty closely identify. Of course, Delilah by name. But the third time was when he was in Gaza with the harlot, and they closed the gates and thought they had him trapped, and he came out and grabbed those gates and hauled them off. So he had a lust for ungodly women, and you, and you know that. Um, All right, well, let's talk about the stories. Let's talk about the stories now of, of Samson. 923. I have six, seven, eight. Eight great victories, some bigger than others, but eight victories that brought uh, deliverance to Israel. And remember, that's his main purpose. He's a judge. 
you never find, you know, when you think of a judge, you find in some of the other cases, people coming to these judges and asking for advice. You never find that with Samson. <laughs> uh, which Philistine daughter should I marry? Um, you know, those are the kind of questions that he would probably get. But, so you don't find that. He's not your judge in the sense that he was wise. He was a judge and that he was a deliverer of Israel militarily. All right, so let's talk about eight different incidents or, or uh, events. First one is the lion incident. The lion incident. Chapter 14, verse 5 and 6 tells us about the lion that roared against him in the vineyards of Timnath. Let me make a couple thoughts on this here. Um, what was he doing in the vineyard? I've heard that preached many times. I'll tell you what he was doing in the vineyard. He lived in the vineyards. <laughs> he lived amongst vineyards. There were vineyards everywhere. So I've heard people many times. I've heard it preached. When I was a teenager, I heard it preached by a good friend or a person who I admire a lot, but I, but I think he was off on this. Uh, what was he doing in the vineyards? Shouldn't have been there in the first place. No, no, he lived there. He couldn't have the grapes, but that doesn't mean that he was out, you know, like Eve, hanging out by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He lived there. Um, another thought is concerning the lions. There are no lion uh, fossils, if you will. People, they've not found evidence that there were lions in the land of Canaan. And so critics of the Bible... This is one place where it talks about a lion. And I'll say, uh, if there were lions, why isn't there evidence? You know, where's the fossils? Where's, you know, and, and a simple answer to that is that they died. Okay? In order for there to be fossils, it had to happen at the flood. Okay? And so if you admit that fossils are created by something catastrophic like the flood, just an animal dying doesn't, you know, think about, well, and a great answer to that is out west over the last 200 years. There used to be massive herds of buffalo by the millions. Okay, where are all the buffalo fossils? They're gone. They're gone. They died and, and they were eaten and they were, you know, or they rotted away. They're gone. And they just, they go back to the earth eventually. Unless there's something, you know, a specific reason why they didn't. They got covered immediately and hardened a rock or fossilized and so on. So anyway, the point is, there's not lion remains there laying around. There's not skulls laying there on top of the ground. You say, well, there used to be lots of lions. No, they're, they're, they're gone. Another answer to that is that there are evidences that there were lions in the land. Such as what? <laughs> Ishtar gates, right? We saw those ourselves. Um, there are, even in the land of Canaan, there are remnants of lion statues. And so they obviously knew what lions were and what they looked like, and there used to be lions around. There's several other references in the Old Testament to lions. Yes? <laughs> He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, and it, and it mentions that, and there have been, there have been evidences like that found. Um, let me see here. There's a Canaanite temple that was excavated at Hazor that had uh, a symbol of a lion on it. Uh, Solomon's temple had lions engraved in certain uh, areas of it, certain portions of it. So... I don't even want to hear that there weren't lions because we have not found hundreds of skulls of lions. Okay, so there were lions and Samson was attacked by a lion. And he just tore the thing apart. Also, secondly, we, we won't take as long on most of these. He slew 30 Philistines to get clothing. He stole the clothes off 30 dead men he killed. I don't know, he had to wash them, I guess, first, right? I mean, he just killed them. There's blood. <laughs> so maybe, maybe he took the clothes off of them and then killed them. 
Shoo. Either way, it's, a, it's kind of an odd thing. Chapter 14. So there, he, again, God used him to punish the Philistines and to deliver the children of Israel. Third, he used burning foxtails to destroy the Philistines' fields. Chapter 15. Man, what an odd, odd thing to do. He's there in the time of harvest. He goes to see his wife. But he had left in a hurry and he was mad because she had told the Philistines what he told her. And uh, then she had been given away to somebody else. And now he's really mad. Verse 5, when he had, sorry, verse 4, Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn or beans or it could be grain, grain of any kind of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks, that's wheat or oats, and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. I mean, he wiped out their, their harvest of olives and all kinds of grains that were real dry and standing shocks. Uh, I've seen many times shocks of grain. You take a bundle of, of wheat, wheat's this tall, you cut it, and you bundle it up, to, and then you stand all these bundles against each other to keep them off the ground. If they fall on the ground, they're going to rot. You get them up into the air, and the sun shines on them, and they dry out. That's, that's the purpose of that. And so they, these foxes run out through these fields. Don't think our huge fields around, you know, like we have. We're talking smaller fields and running up over the hill and so on, and everything's small and compact, and it just roasted everything. But the, the concept of catching 300 foxes and not getting bit as you're tying their tails together. Oh, my goodness. I get a big kick out of it. My family and, I, and my daughter especially, you know, we don't like foxes. Uh, we're very much biased against foxes. Yeah. Remember that? I bit my daughter. Sorry. Yeah, that was a fox. Yeah, it was a fox. Shoo. Anyway, any thoughts on catching the foxes? They're hard. They're, hard. Uh, they're very wily. Remember that? A wily old fox? Uh, they're very savvy. He might He'd had to trap them. He might have had to or trap them. Or, I know like, sometimes when they get rabies, they're not scared of people. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're That's right. possible, too, that they had rabies. So then he had to get rabies shots after he was done. Yeah. Yes? To get right. all of them in one period, that's, that's pretty amazing, even without yeah. having to catch them manually. Okay, but, and I agree with that. It's also true that um, when there's not a lot of people covering an area, that you're going to have more animals. So you'd have lions, and you'd have foxes, and you'd have, you'd have more animals. Yes? And also, it wasn't like... He was just attacking one field in one place and set 300 foxes off in the one right. field. He went everywhere in the Philistines' <laughs> land and their territory. So he was yeah. going different places and catching them and setting them loose in the fields. Yeah. That's just how many years ago. Yep. He needed just a fire-blowing machine, you know, just walk out there like Arnold Schwarzenegger and just blow everything up. <laughs> so instead of that, he used foxes. Uh, chapter 15 then, uh, uh, later in the passage there, in chapter 15, verse 7 and 8. After the fire, Samson said to them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock Edom. So there's another event where he, the Bible calls it a great slaughter. A great slaughter. Chapter 15, verses 7 and 8. So this is already the fourth time that he has killed or at least really bothered the Philistines. A great display of a victory for Israel. Okay, number five, uh, later in chapter 15 then, he kills 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. All right, how big is the jawbone of a donkey? 
course, you can picture a horse. So a horse is much bigger than a donkey, right? Um, to, to say it's, I don't know, you showed it about that, but I think that's too big. I think it would be a little shorter. It'd just be that bone, the bottom part of the jaw. Um, yeah, it'd be the bottom part of the jaw. It'd probably be about uh, 14 to 16, 18 inches long, something like that. And, sorry? Dagger size. Dagger size, but, but I think on one end of it, it would be smaller and give you like a club effect. And so you could get a good hold of it. Uh, maybe he grabbed at the, the teeth end of it, and then the bigger part of it is back here where it, where it uh, enlarges and so on. And it just was a great club. But still, this is hand-to-hand -hand combat um, with thousands of people, and he kills 1,000 of them. Now again, I, I just loved all the details. How, how did he count them? <laughs> you know, did he kill them all and then you know, go through them and lay them all out in rows of 100 or whatever? Uh, but the Bible says that there were a thousand of them that he killed with the jawbone of a donkey. And then, of course, he takes a drink out of that jawbone once he's done. <clears throat> Let's read the story, though. They, they, he's in the top of the rock Edom. And the uh, Israelites say, come up to him, the men of Judah, and said, hey, the Philistines want you. He said, oh, okay, I'm here. And they said, no, we want, we want we, for them to leave us alone, if, they'll leave us alone if we give you to them. And he said, okay, that's fine. Take me down there. Um, verse 13, they spake unto him, saying, no, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand, but surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him in two new cords and brought him up from the rock. Because Samson made them promise that they wouldn't hurt him themselves. Verse 14, when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him. Verse 15, he found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. This to me is the, where his faith is seen. He comes down out of this rock knowing that God's going to deliver him. Knowing that God's going to <laughs> make him invincible. He doesn't know what he's going to use. He comes down there and he says, okay, what can I use? And he looks around and speaking of the bones of dead animals, there's a jawbone of a donkey, which he wasn't supposed to touch. <laughs> but God, I think, let him this in this case. See, even in the case of the lion, you know, what's he supposed to do? Not kill the lion? He can just touch the lion, right? No, no, no. The, 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 the vow, the Nazarite vow, didn't mean that he couldn't protect himself. But anyway, he reaches out and he grabs what's available, the jawbone of a donkey. And, you know, this great picture that you, God uses those who are available. And uh, he, he uses Samson here in this case. Then he sings a nice little song about it. He makes a poem. Samson said in verse 16, With the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass have I slain a thousand men. Nice little song. Nice little night-night lullaby. With the jawbone of an ass, heap, up, heaps upon heaps. <laughs> uh, hey, when you're good, you can sing, write some songs about it, you know. I'm kidding. All right, so that's number five. Number six, chapter 16, he goes down to another Philistine city, to Gaza, and saw there a harlot. And he went in unto her. He was told the Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither. Boy, they got a champion. Everybody knows now who Samson is. He's this, the champion of the Israelites. And uh, Samson's coming hither, and they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson laid till midnight, arose at midnight, took the doors of the gate of the city, the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders, and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. Came to pass afterward another story. So he carried a city gate 20 miles away. If that's the meaning of that, that he went up almost to Hebron. And again, great uh, display of strength. I can just imagine the Philistines in their shock, coming out there the next morning saying, oh yeah, we got this guy. 
and not just the gate was busted open, you know, there had to have been soldiers around the gate. They're all gone. Everybody's ran scared. But he literally, I mean, the gate in the entire framework for the gate and the bar, the bar would be a heavy bar connecting the two gates with some kind of a thing to keep it from, clo- from opening and closing. It's all gone. And, and nobody knows where it is. It's not just broken down. It's not just you know, carried out or torn out of the ground and thrown to the ground. It's gone. Nobody knows where it went. Um, huge gates would have weighed, prob- I've heard different estimates on this, no less than half a ton. Uh, carried off and probably weighed much more than that. Okay, number seven then. <clears throat> we see the uh, story of Delilah and when she's trying to get him to tell her the secret to his strength. He does several things and we'll, we'll combine all of these together. Um, he has bowstrings. strings uh, used to, to bind him. Let's see here. He's in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Um, verse 7. If they bind me with seven green widths, these are some kind of uh, strings of a plant, you know, part of a plant that they would use for, for making string out of. Widths that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. So they come up, and of course, they're hiding in the chamber. He wakes up to these Philistines being all around him, and he break the widths as a thread of tow is broken when it toucheth the fire, so his strength was not known. And so, of course, she com- continues to come at him, come at him, trying to figure out what his strength is. One of the things that they do, verse 13, uh, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web, the weaver's web, and she fastened it with the pin and said unto him. So what had they done here? They took his hair, or he had his hair in seven locks. Now, that's how much hair he had. Seven big locks of hair. And I, I don't understand this, of course, because I don't have lots of hair. But neither do any of us guys. But uh, uh, to have that much hair divided into seven sections and big, strong sections of hair. And if you tie that down to the weaver's web, which would have been somewhat heavy, but also it would have just been horribly awkward to try to pull something along with your hair and defend yourself at the same time. So when the Philistines come in there, what does he do? He went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. He just slung the whole thing around, and here goes this whole weaver's beam and everything, the whole contraption. He's just swinging off the back of his head, and he goes to work killing Philistines. And, of course, finally he tells her that the real thing is a spiritual thing. It's not a a physical thing. It's spiritual. It's his God uh, had made... uh, he had made a commitment to his God that he would not cut his hair. And now he tells her that, and she has his hair cut, and of course, they capture him. All right, and then the eighth thing that he does is he pulls down the Philistine temple. And uh, so this God, the Philistine God, seems to get the victory through this. And we're going, to be, we're going to be out of time here, so I'm going to stop here. But these are eight great victories that Samson has displaying his power over the Philistines. We'll see, we'll look later at his life ending in tragedy, and then a few other thoughts about Samson and uh, how God used him in spite, in spite of what he had done.